So this morning, um, we are beginning um, the follow-up to our Made to Marred series from the opening chapters of Genesis as we turn our attention to the last book of the Bible and prayerfully consider being marred to now remade. I say prayerfully because each of us ultimately must make a choice. Will we remain marred by our sin or will we be remade through salvation in Christ and Christ alone? The book of Revelation should point everyone to the new life that we find in him. It should cause us to remain faithful in our worship of him. No matter what, we remain fixed on our hope that is in Jesus until he returns. This is the word of our Lord. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Reading Revelation provides challenges. Yet even within its challenges, we should commit ourselves to understanding the book of Revelation because, well, it's part of God's word. And as we begin, a number of key principles should shape our reading of it. For one, it makes no sense to read the last chapter of a novel without reading any of the chapters that come before it. In the same way, it makes no sense to read the last book of the Bible without having first read the previous 65 books. This especially proves true when we consider that the 404 verses of Revelation contain 518 references or allusions to earlier scripture. Next, we should not set out to read Revelation as it's being some kind of horoscope that simply predicts the future. Keep in mind Jesus' words just before his ascension in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Nevertheless, while we cannot know the times or the seasons, we should be preparing for them. Third, Revelation is highlighted by four key sections, each one marked by John being in the Spirit. Verse 1 begins, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And then at verse 10 he says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit. Chapter 4 Verses 1 and 2, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit. Chapter 17, at verses 1 through 3, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute. Then the angel carried me away in the Spirit. Chapter 21, verses 9 and 10, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, and he carried me away in the Spirit. More than anything, 
As we come to our reading of Revelation, I pray that this sermon series will facilitate for you a fresh encounter with the text. That our exploration together will challenge your imaginations, it will challenge your hearts, it will challenge your minds, not as academics, but as worshipers of Jesus Christ. I agree with Eugene Peterson that the Holy Spirit's gracious purpose in giving us the word in written form is not to turn us into Bible students, but to provide us the means by which we can be transformed into all inspired, devoted worshipers of Jesus who are willing to follow him through great tribulations, even unto death. Along the way, it is unlikely that you will agree with every perspective that I share, and that's okay. Because once again, reading Revelation provides for us a number of challenges. Many things seem unusual to us in this biblical book. It is why Joel Beek suggests we imagine ourselves as wandering through Revelation like missionaries entering into a strange land. So finally, in reading Revelation, we must consider its culture, its language, its traditions. In Jewish culture, the book of Revelation is part of what we call apocalyptic literature. In fact, the Greek word apocalypsis literally means revelation. It's having something uncovered or unveiled right before our eyes. The inspiration behind biblical apocalyptic text is summarized in Daniel chapter 22 at verse 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Revelation invites us to see the mysteries that the Holy Spirit, along with a few members of the angelic host, reveal to John. It is not uncommon in this book for John to say, I saw this, or I saw that. And in order for us to see with the apostle, we must often approach the text in the same manner as poets. We must uncover and interpret passages filled with imagery, symbolism, analogy, imagination, repetition, and so on. In our opening of the pages of Revelation, we find it replete with word pictures. Word pictures that require us to slow down and meditate carefully about their deeper meaning. We find that numbers and time references are mainly symbolic and other details are as well. We see that Things are like other things, and we encounter animals and dragons and beasts that our eyes have never seen. Additionally, we will find in this patterns being repeated. Such poetic language will lend itself to varied interpretation, that is for sure. It is why none of us should be surprised that multiple interpretations exist from the reading of Revelation. But Revelation is not just poetic, it is also prophetic. Whereas apocalypsis has to do with seeing, prophecy has to do with speaking that which God reveals. The prophet's declaration can be forthtelling or it can be future telling. But whatever God's prophet tells us, we had best heed the message. Let me share now just a few things that I can say with absolute certainty. To begin, consistent with James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, God's blessing does not fall on those who merely hear the word. We must keep it. We are to guard the Holy Bible as a precious treasure and to practice all its ways. 
Some of Jesus' sharpest disagreements took place with the scribes and the Pharisees, individuals who knew the scripture well, but who were never transformed by it. The Old Testament became simply a book for them to use in order to establish rules, in order to argue religion, not as a means for God's love to shape who they were. How is it that people can give so much attention to the Word of God and practically remain so unaffected by it? Do not let that be said of us. Rather, let our reading of Revelation affirm our blessed assurance. The blessing is for those who Revelation 14.4 says, follow the Lamb wherever He goes, regardless of what eschatology they affirm. Verse 3 is the first of seven blessings pronounced in Revelation. Seven suggest a connection with the days of creation. As God blessed the creation, so he blesses those who become a new creation in Christ. I am also certain that seven, which symbolizes completion in Jewish culture, proves an important number throughout the book of Revelation. The seven churches to which John communicates are historical churches, but they also represent the universal church throughout the ages. The church, both then and now, could expect persecution consistent with Christ's words in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. John thus recognizes that the vision he receives serves as the culmination of the full biblical and prophetic tradition. Only he was not writing to satisfy curiosity about the future, but as a means of encouragement, no matter the scale of persecution that the church would face. What response does John intend to pastorally evoke in this poetic, prophetic, apocalyptic letter? Simply this, for you and me to claim victory in Jesus. This response is crucial in light of John saying what must happen soon and the time being near. Ideas that are repeated multiple times across the chapters of Revelation. Regardless of how one interprets that language, what it means for certain is that we must prepare ourselves. We must prepare ourselves by believing the testimony about Jesus, and we must prepare ourselves to remain faithful to the word of that testimony. Having said what I know for certain, let me share with you a little of what presently shapes some of my interpretation. I cannot speak this with certainty. Revelation was either written prior to AD 70 during Nero's persecution of the church, or it was written closer to AD 96 under the brutal reign of Domitian. It has to be one of those two. The Roman Emperor Domitian was a savage to all persons, but he hated Christians the most. He commanded that everyone in the empire call him Lord and God. When Christians refused, he persecuted and killed them. Those who argue for the early dating largely fall into a camp known as preterists. They contend that John is simply writing during a period prior to the fall of Jerusalem and the burning down of its temple. This is why he could say to the seven historical churches that the time is near. There are then three primary traditions associated with the reading of Revelation, and I oversimplify them here. Preterists typically embrace the tradition of post-millennialism, 
Since they think the words of John simply product, predict the destruction of Jerusalem, they believe the Bible's prophecies of the end times have already been fulfilled, that the tribulation of Revelation has already taken place. In this view, the church will ultimately usher in a millennium kingdom of peace on earth through its evangelistic mission. Post the millennial, Jesus will return. Others do not concern themselves as much with the dating of Revelation at all, especially those in the amillennial tradition. They believe that the millennial period is a symbolic spiritual time that exists between Jesus' death and Jesus' second coming. It's not a literal 1,000 years, thus it's absent the millennial. Satan, they say, was bound at the cross. As a result, the gospel can continue to spread during this symbolic millennial period until Satan is loosed for a final period of deception, which leads to the end of the age and the point when Jesus comes again to devour the wicked. The other camp categorize themselves as futurists, are premillennialists, pre the millennial, prior to the millennial kingdom, there is a great tribulation. Then Jesus will come. Here we have two divisions, the historic premillennialist and the dispensational premillennialist. The latter argue for the rapture of Christians to heaven before the Great Tribulation. Those in this camp tend to suggest that the letters of the seven churches stand for the successive ages of church history leading up to the rapture of the church in Revelation 4 and verse 1. Living Christians, they say, will not go through the Great Tribulation period, but Jesus will secretly take them out of the world prior to this time of wrath. I hold to an historic premillennialist position that Jesus will come only once and at the end of the Great Tribulation. That his triumphant coming will be visible to all and it will immediately precede a 1,000 year literal millennial kingdom. And that at the final moment of this age, there will follow that millennium an ushering in of the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity. So as I preach through our reading of Revelation, I will preach with that tradition in mind, albeit with a few twists within it. I currently hold to this perspective while readily acknowledging that strong, godly Christians hold to other positions. And one way or another, believers should not read Revelation in a divisive spirit because you see, reading Revelation presents Christ. The Bible's purpose all of it, including the book of Revelation, is to draw our hearts and our minds closer to Jesus, not to win a religious debate. So let us faithfully worship together in the victory that is granted to us through the Lamb who was slain. Like the number seven in Hebrew, the number three is also symbolic. It communicates sufficiency. In verses 4 and 5, John highlights the all-sufficient triune God. One, John draws our attention to the abiding presence of God the Father. God's sovereign presence is sufficient for us. Notice the threefold formula, who is who was and who is to come. We will speak more to what that practically means for us as a church next Sunday. Two, 
John then presents the comfort that comes to the church through God the Spirit. The reference to the seven spirits must be the Holy Spirit. He is in the throne room and he is inspiring the prophetic message of Scripture, a role that 2 Peter 1.21 identifies the Holy Spirit alone performs. It makes sense then that the seven spirits connect, direct, connect directly and independently with the seven churches through a prophetic word. Again, John is using the number seven symbolically to indicate the fullness and the perfection of the Spirit in all that he does. Peter Lightheart explains beautifully the way that John's reference to the seven spirits must be the third person of the Trinity. The hovering spirit of Genesis 1 verse 2 pulses in seven evenings and seven mornings, forming the sevenfold rhythm of the universe. In Zechariah chapter 4, the seven lamps are the seven eyes of God. And Revelation 5, 6 identifies the Lamb's seven eyes with the seven spirits. Isaiah eleven twelve 12 then describes the sevenfold gifts that the Spirit will bestow on the Messiah. The Holy Spirit will further empower the universal church represented by the seven churches of Asia Minor to become the temple in which God dwells. So the seven spirits is the spirit of creation, the eyes of God, and the spirit that empowers the Messiah and the Messianic people. Christians in John's day desperately needed the empowerment that the Holy Spirit brings. Let that also echo in our hearts and minds in today's world because we desperately need the Spirit's empowerment too. Additionally, we know from Scripture that the actions of Trinity are one. Whatever one person in the Trinity does, God is doing as a whole. Yet in Revelation, we find the focus squarely placed on Jesus as the victorious Savior of the church. I, I think of my friend, I don't know if he's listening right now or if he's asleep with his eyes open, but I think of my friend Joe Lorenz. Joe said to me, I believe the Trinity, but I, I kind of emphasize Jesus the most. That's actually what's happening in, in Revelation. Joe, you should appreciate that. Redemption comes to all believers by the sufficiency of the work of the Son of God. Here we uncover yet another threefold formula that expresses complete Sufficiency. Jesus is our priest. He is our prophet. He is our king. First, Jesus is the faithful witness. In this sense, he is our prophet come to perfectly reveal the Father. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we are told in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Second, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. The hope that we have over sin, death, and the grave comes solely through the power of Christ's death and resurrection. And in this way, he is our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 10 explains how Jesus accomplished what no other Jewish priest could. Christ did not have to go in year after year into the Holy of Holies, but he fulfilled our necessary sacrifice once and for all by his blood. And as the firstborn in the resurrection, he guarantees there will be a second and a third and so on, because all who are united in him through saving faith will be resurrected with the Lord in glory. Third, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
And that language links back to Psalm 89, verse 27. It's where we have the designation of the royal monarch. It was an expression of how the king maintained a place of preeminence over his subjects. Only Jesus' rule is one of sacrificial service. We are thus meant to see the supremacy of Jesus over all the flawed political and kings of this world. Let me summarize the three statements as they bear repeating. Jesus is the prophet who bears perfect testimony of God's being. Jesus is the priest who secures salvation for us and who intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the king who ushers in to, uh, into us eternal life as he serves us and establishes us as joint heirs. See, Jesus delivered us by his Passover blood and through his exodus as the firstborn from the dead, having loved us, having come to our rescue by dying to deliver us, he makes for us a ruling people again, like Adam was intended to be in Eden. John is undoubtedly drawing our hearts and our minds to Exodus 19, verse 6, where God says to Israel, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In this way, reading Revelation prepares the church. Reading Revelation prepares the church for distinct challenges. We will soon find in John's communication to the seven churches of Asia Minor that each congregation was unique in its makeup. Each faced different problems. Each reacted differently to the various problems that they held in common. And once again, these churches are symbolic of the church across the ages, meaning the applications we will draw from the seven churches of Asia Minor are also relevant to our particular church. It's relevant to Winstanley Baptist Church. A mega church does not deal with the same struggles as a small one. A wealthy church does not deal with the same struggles as a blue collared one. A young church does not deal with the same struggles as an aging one. You get the gist. Yet the point is, no matter the differences, God calls every church to remain faithful to Christ and remain active in sharing the gospel. What are we to be prepared for? To share the good news until Jesus comes. That's the purpose of the church. Are we being prepared for it? And are we doing it? Reading Revelation prepares the church for faithful service. Salvation is not just what Jesus comes to provide us. It's, it's preparing us. He saves us for something. The verbs in verses 5 and 6 say that Jesus loves us, freed us, and made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Journalist Rachel Rodriguez wrote about a ceremony in which 150 immigrants were sworn in as United States citizens. And speaking with them, one of those individuals said, for me, American citizenship means freedom of expression and to live and work in a free country. To be an American is not just a great honor. It's an obligation to do more and to reach higher. Amid all the negative narratives swirling about in our country right now, Rodriguez's quote, and I believe A.T.'s earlier reminder about why we celebrate Memorial Day, communicates to us the manifold blessings that our nation still enjoys. 
But the Apostle John reminds us of a far greater citizenship in a far greater kingdom. J. Scott Duvall sums it up well. Salvation brings more than forgiveness for sins. It also brings citizenship into God's kingdom. Jesus has not simply saved us from judgment. He has saved us for his mission. I, for one, would classify that as an obligation to do more and to reach higher. And this obligation to do more and to reach higher looks like daily presenting ourselves in the worship of the Lord as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Church, let us be a faithful kingdom of priests. Finally, reading Revelation prepares the church for persecution. The dark clouds of tribulation will fall upon the church one way or another, but God's people will never be vanquished because God is the great I am, who is, who was, and who always shall be. The church can rest in the blessed assurance of Paul's words from Romans 8, 31 to 39. I know it's a lengthy text, but I want to read it to you. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, our hardship, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our danger, our sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you want to know what Revelation is about? It's about you being more than a conqueror in Jesus. I honestly, I honestly do not care if someone is postmillennial, if someone is amillennial, if someone is premillennial, in either one of its variants. I don't care. You know what I care about? Do you know Jesus? And are you faithfully following him? Because that's what the word of God reveals. Clearly, certainly, surely, plainly, indisputably. That Jesus came. He lived a life that we could not live. He died the death we deserved. He rose again from the grave. He ascended in power to the right hand of his father and he's coming again. Do you believe that? If you believe that, this is what I know for sure. You have a seat at the table of the lamb. You've got a seat. And so there are going to be challenges as we read Revelation. And there are going to be parts where you say, I just don't agree with you, Timothy. But do you agree with me on the principles that are revealed clearly about the gospel? 
Because that's what matters. Church, that's what matters. And if you do, you are more than conquerors in Christ who loved you, who saved you, and made you a kingdom of priests before his Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, give us hearts that are ready to follow you no matter what. Lord, give us hearts that cling to the certainty of the gospel no matter what. Lord, give us hearts that are pliable and that want to see afresh the words of your truth. Let us never become apathetic or we just sit on our hands in church and walk away and say, well, that was okay, or that was good, or that was, oh, that was great. The only thing that's great is the name of our king. Let him be exalted in this world. And let that exaltation start right here at Winstanley Baptist Church. That as we leave, we leave as a kingdom of priests made to make people aware of their need to follow Jesus. Oh, even so, as we labor here, come, Lord Jesus, we pray. In your name, amen. Our song response is, wherever he leads, I'll go. <laughs> I pray that that would be the spirit of our hearts. Wherever he leads, that's where I'll go. If you have a decision to make for Jesus today, the altar is open. Let's stand together as we sing.